Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kellen Rusinello and I am Senior Policy Manager with the Drug Policy Alliance. I'm joined by my colleague, Lindsay LaSalle, Managing Director of Public Health and Public Health Law and Policy, who will be facilitating the Q&A section of this discussion. This is the third in Drug Policy Alliance's series of conversations on drug policy and COVID-19. You can access recordings of our previous conversations on decarceration and reentry on our website, along with DPA's policy recommendations for all areas of drug policy during and after COVID-19. We hope you will join us for our future discussions, including our next conversation on harm reduction and COVID-19 on June 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I'd like to share the structure of the call and how you can join us. We'll be speaking with the panel for about 90 minutes, and then we will transition to a Q&A portion of the call. Please join the conversations by leaving com comments in the chat box and click Q&A to ask our speakers uh, a question. Both of those buttons can be found on the bottom of your screen. Don't forget to tweet any comments or discussions you find thought provoking or important. Today's discussion is entitled Improving Substance Use Disorder Treatment During and After the COVID-19 Pandemic. I'll set the stage by noting that the vast majority of people who use drugs do not develop a substance use disorder. Of those that do, most people don't need treatment and will progress out of it without any formalized interventions. All people who use drugs should have access to health and harm reduction services, regardless of whether they want to access treatment. And also remember again to join our conversation on harm reduction June 25th. For those that do want treatment, affordable evidence-based treatment should be readily accessible. With that in mind, let me introduce our speakers so we can start discussing how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected treatment access and whether we will emerge on the other side with better access for the populations that want it. Dr. Anjali Taneja is a family physician and DJ who's passionate about reimagining healthcare and healing in the US. She is the executive director of Casa de Salud, culturally humble, anti-racist and accessible nonprofit model of care that integrates primary, acute, and queer, gen, tran, queer and transgender care, harm reduction services, treatment for opioid addictions, counseling, and indigenous-based healing circles for primarily marginalized communities in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Anjali also works in the emergency room of a small rural hospital in the Navajo Nation, two hours west of Albuquerque. Anjali is board certified in family medicine and addiction medicine, and is a fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Anjali was a 2016 to 2019 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholar, a Next City Vanguard 40 Under 40 Urban Leader in 2016, and is a member of the Creating Health Collaborative, an international collaborative of health innovators who are invited to share their ideas and visions of health beyond healthcare. Welcome, Anjali. Dr. Kima Joy Taylor is the founder of Anka Consulting, a healthcare consulting firm, and a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute. She most recently served as the National Drug Addiction Treatment and Harm Reduction Program Director at the Open Society Foundations. She oversaw grant making that supported the expansion of access to a non-putative continuum of integrated evidence-informed and culturally effective substance use disorder services. Prior to, jo to joining Open Society Foundations, Kima served as Deputy Commissioner for the Baltimore City Health Department, a health and social policy legislative assistant for Senator Paul Sarbanes, and a pediatrician at a federally qualified health center in Washington, DC. Kima is a graduate of Brown University, Brown University School of Medicine, and the Georgetown University Residency Program in Pediatrics. In 2002, Kima was awarded a Commonwealth Foundation Fellowship in Minority Health Policy at Harvard University. Welcome, Kima. Dr. Lisa Buglisi is an assistant professor of medicine at Yale University, where she practices primary care and addiction medicine. She is Director of Transitions Clinic New Haven, a multidisciplinary clinic that is part of the national network of programs that focus on care of individuals who are returning to the community from incarceration. Her clinical practice includes treatment of addiction and hepatitis C in primary care, and she also oversees a medical legal partnership. She has developed specific skills in training, hiring, and supervising community health workers and directing interdisciplinary teams of physicians, mid-level providers, community health workers, research personnel, and legal colleagues around the work of clinical care and research to improve the health of people with recent incarceration. She's originally from the New Haven area and deeply committed to her community. Lisa received her undergraduate degree from Tufts University, her medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and completed her medical training at the Yale New Haven Hospital. Welcome, Lisa. 
Dr. Richard Rawson is Professor Emeritus at the UCLA Department of Psychiatry and a research professor at the Vermont Center for Behavior and Health at the University of Vermont. Richard has conducted numerous clinical trials on pharmacological and psychosocial behavioral addiction treatments, including contingency management studies for individuals with cocaine and methamphetamine use disorders. He has led addiction research and training projects for the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and the U.S. State Department, exploring science-based knowledge to many parts of the world. Richard has published three books, 45 book chapters, and over 250 peer-reviewed articles, and has conducted over 1,000 workshops, paper presentations, and training sessions. Welcome, Richard. Dr. Rupa Sethi is an assistant professor at the Kansas University Medical Center, program director for the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship at KU, and a practicing addiction psychiatrist in the Kansas University Addiction Clinic. She is certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. She completed a fellowship at the Yale New Haven Hospital. She earned her medical degree from Kesterba Medical College and completed her residency at the Carilion Clinic at Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. In the past, she has worked as the Director of Addiction Psychiatry at Southwest Network in Phoenix, Arizona. She is currently involved with the State Targeted Response and State Opioid Response Grants for Treating Opioid Addiction, awarded to Kansas University from both the states of Kansas and Missouri. Welcome, Rupa. Uh, so Kima, I, I think I wanna start the conversation with you. Um, COVID-19 has disrupted essentially every area of life, especially healthcare services and this includes access to substance use disorder treatment. Some of the temporary changes undertaken by the government um, represent some of the most radical changes we've seen to treatment access in decades. Um, I'm hoping you can start us off with, you know, what did treatment look like prior to COVID-19? What barriers were there for people trying to access treatment? And uh, how did the response, how did the response to, um, COVID, the government's response to COVID-19 change access to treatment and positively and negatively and what remains to be addressed. Great, thank you. Um, first, I really do wanna thank Kellen and DPA for inviting me to speak. I'll be honest, I had some real hesitation around during this webinar because I think that treatment is always pulled out at this, as this discrete thing and substance use and always pulled out in a way that seems to solve any issue uh, that's related to drug use. And it's, it kind of belies the reality of life and also belies the reality of chronic concerns. And so it allows us to kind of ignore the history of racialization of substance use and allows us to not try to create proactive, comprehensive, effective, patient-centered, and equitable continuum of solutions. But Kellen said I could go off my diatribe, so I agreed to do it. Um, so I, I want to give a broader general frame Right, and then talk, then I promise I will get to substance use services and I don't use treatment because I think we do have to offer a whole continuum of services and then the effects of COVID. Um, so with my general frame, um, substance use responses have long been racialized and I do not, like, it is very dangerous to try and think of a, of a solution during COVID or post COVID without admitting to that past history. And it's often secondary to racism, but also a fear by the majority population of possible job losses. And I think that's really important as we move past COVID. I think of health in a very broad space, so bear with me. Um, but you know, even the early opium ordinances in San Francisco that were against the Chinese, racism and the fact they're like, oh, we think the Chinese are gonna take our jobs. A lot of the marijuana prohibition in the 1900s were aimed at Mexicans, um, war on drugs, blacks. And we know that these were, had, were purposefully racially based um, and that substance use crises aren't new and our racial responses aren't new. The differential in, in how we respond to things is not new, be it crack, heroin, cocaine. There's heroin crisis early in the 1900s, including Mary Todd Lincoln. And the response to that was very different even in the 1900s from what we saw at the crack epidemic. So we talk about response though, we really do have to talk about effective integration of substance use services that take on all substances. So creating a system that provide a panoply of services for all substances and get away from racial dichotomies when we look at that. We have to really think of solutions and success as we do for other chronic concerns. And it con includes a continuum of care and includes effective care for folks at all stages. So not just saying, you know, you have to go into treatment, that's the only answer, and you have to be abstinent. Whatever your drug use is, there are, need to be services that support your health 
in the best way possible. Success can, cannot and should not be defined in justice terms. I've said this before in settings and I'm gonna keep saying it, like jail and prison were not deemed to be a way to treat substance use. They were deemed as a punishment. And if you read what Earl Ekman said, it is a punishment to put black people away. Any research, any studies that say, we're gonna compare how this works against jail or prison is just not only not helpful, it's truly useless because it perpetuates something that brings even more racism into a racist system, right? The healthcare system already has enough racism, trust me. But if you bring the justice system response and the justice system's definitions of what quality of care and what success are, you're just compounding the racism and all the other racial and ethnic disparities. So pre-COVID, we weren't exactly knocking it out of the park. That's, I, and I think that's very important because I really don't think we should go back to what we were doing. We need to think strategically and thoughtfully about what a system that we would like to see post-COVID. And that requires understanding and taking in what happened in the past. So, but not to be a Debbie Downer, space was starting to open up and we were starting to see some improvements, right? They were requiring substance use services to be covered when they, where they weren't before, especially amongst insurance. ACA strengthened this, which is great if you have insurance, right? And ACA in some areas expanded Medicaid so that more people did have access. But access, access did not always truly mean um, easily accessible care, didn't mean it was patient-centered, didn't mean it was necessarily culturally and linguistically effective, it was not necessarily evidence-informed. At times, it was just a place to go where you did not, where if you didn't do what you were supposed to, you were kicked out. And so really having some quality around and quality assessment around what substance use services are and what they should be is going to be important. Um, so we, but we were working on it. There was some, there was some work, but it still wasn't really viewed as a chronic concern. And then the opioid crisis came and the racial dynamics of that were so obvious and so dangerous for most of us, right? And so now there's this prescription drug crisis and substance use was affecting white people and affecting them, um, the use of prescriptions and people started to care about it. They started to talk about a public health response, started to want to use this public health approach. And there were two reasons for that. One, because impacted populations, which were predominantly white, and there's a whole racial history about access to pain care that goes with why, why that was. But also, I truly believe it's because it could be framed that it was the doctor's fault. And so it wasn't like those other people that use opioids, those bad people. They became addicted because of the doctor, so they're blameless and we should do something for them. Um, now I'm a doc. I absolutely admit there was bad news, we messed up. I will own that the healthcare system gave out too many prescriptions and did a bad job. But I would say actually bigger than that, the thing we really failed on, and I will own this for myself too, is we weren't screening people. Like if we were screening people and doing it effectively and providing harm reduction services and brief intervention services, I really do not think the level of overdoses and addiction would have been so high. So there's myriad ways where the healthcare system was not doing its job. And I was part of that problem, right? I can own that. Didn't give out a lot of prescriptions because I served uninsured patients, they couldn't afford it, but wasn't screening, right? So, um, and so I think, you know, and then people will say, well, Black people didn't have access to narcotics, prescription narcotics, so that was good news. But no, because what it did by creating that slight frame of just prescription drugs, it allowed responses and money to go to certain groups and not to others. So we, and, and black people couldn't even get pain medicine, but that's a whole other diatribe that I'll do later. Um, so I think this slowed the implementation of harm reduction in a really deep day, deep way, and it led to further HIV outbreaks. So our dim, small, narrow view really hurt people because harm reduction, it was seen as those other groups that didn't get adopted, uh, addicted um, by doctors and so were bad people. And so you shouldn't use the responses. No one ran to Baltimore to say, what does um, really great harm reduction look like? No one ran to Chicago because we didn't want people to be like those people. So until policymakers really shut down access to prescription narcotics, right? And they're like, we're closing the pill mills. And white people, people as well as blacks and others were starting to move to heroin and ultimately fentanyl. And so now naloxone seemed like it was something to give out that we should probably do. Now still more to first responders and not to actual people who are using drugs. Med medication assisted treatment, which was originally harm reduction, right? Now all of a sudden everyone was really supporting it and pushing it. And there was slow interest. I would say not fast enough, but slow interest. And again, for some and not others. And the substance use affects us 
the substance use effects us all slogan really allowed folks to believe that Reagan's kind of trickle down economics theory also worked with trickle down healthcare. That since we're putting in remedies for all people, though predominantly white, somehow that's going to trickle down and communities of color are going to see the same uh, positive effects. So all in all, changes were sort of slow. They were happening, but they were still biased. Even as BUP was expanding, it was expanding in a way that more white people were offered it than black people. Methadone was still demonized and regulated. And, and so it's like, that can go to black people because that's for those people. Um, and, and you know, why does it need to be regulated? You can give it out for pain medication, but you couldn't give it out with an eight hour course like you do for buprenorphine. So really inherent things within that. And under all that, why not focus on how the racist and biased justice system was and, and is? And it's not just going to prison, right? It's bad enough you're going to prison, you have absolutely no treatment, but it's the trauma of being in jail or prison. It's a lot of collateral consequences of coming out and it affects your job opportunities, your education, your employment, and all of that were higher for people of color. But no worries, there was not a lot of concern. And in fact, many people felt like it was okay if you just kind of tinker with the justice system and make it softer and warmer without being honest about how those collateral and Consequences were infecting individuals, much less communities and families. Then COVID happened, right? And guess what? The healthcare system and substance use system can change quickly. All the excuses you've been given, they can actually do it. And so BUP, you can get you know, phone prescription. You can actually be inducted by phone. You don't have to go in for a first person visit. Although methadone, again, remember I told you BUP was used more often, prescribed more often to white people, methadone more often to black people. Methadone, you have to go in for a visit to get initiated. Um, but you could still actually give out extended prescriptions if your doc felt that you should have them. So that's where we still have to work through all that implicit and racial bias. Um, but the point is things can change. So now is the opportunity that we really have to harness change for good. We have to think about how to create a patient-centered equitable continuum that's not just the narrow vision of treatment, right? It's how do you provide services for people who need it so they can have the best health ever while they're using drugs or not. And I, you know, I wanna bring up two places where I think there's opportunities and then we have to be really thoughtful about how we use them. One is around COVID for sure and decarceration. And some of the concern I had around the decarceration conversations was there is a, not a robust set of services of what happens after someone's decarcerated. If they're decarcerated and they don't have a house and they may be positive for, for COVID though no one knows because no one's actually tested, they should actually have a safe place to go to get quarantined. They should have food delivered so they can actually eat. They should have all the other basic services that we would want to have. And so just calling for decarceration and saying that Medicaid would take care of it is actually somewhat dangerous because they're not. And the fact is states received money through CARES that they could provide all of this. And so I'll use something that my, um, I used to work with some folks from Racial Justice Action Center, and I use this all the time because it was so fabulous. But one of the participants there said that, um, you know, what we need to do is we need to raise the lowest boat. So the boat that's sinking the most, if we raise that boat, then truly everyone can breathe. Whereas if you raise just the top level boat, everyone else is still under the water in their boats, right? And so with these conversations, we have to think of the most vulnerable populations. What are they lacking? What do they need? What do we need to provide for them to be as, as, um, as healthy as possible? And then demand that. Demand, yes, Medicaid's important, access to healthcare is important, but a lot of people are asymptomatic and they still need food, they still need housing and all those other basic services. And I, that brings me also to the changes around now, changes that are happening because of George Floyd. And the same way, I think there's an opportunity. If we're gonna say, take out the money from the defund the police, what are we putting in place? What are we gonna ask for? And getting our agenda together, and it can't just be a treatment agenda. It can't just be a healthcare system, because remember I told you that was racist too. It has to be an agenda of the way we want the world to be and how it is, and then get the money. There is money out there there is money that if we frame it um, effectively and if we argue and protest and riot that we can get it, but it really does require looking at the most vulnerable. It really requires a whole continuum of services. And when I say continuum of services, it's not just harm reduction, not just methadone or treatment, it's housing, it's food, it's, um, it's, a, it's how do we be creative? And we know they can do it because they changed on a dime with COVID. So all of that, and Kellen's probably never going to ask me to do a talk again, I would like to pass it on to the next person. Thank you so much, Kima. No, no, you just proved that I, I, you know, I should be inviting you to these things. Um, I think everybody has uh, 
uh, that brilliant um, found something from your talk. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, in particular, I'd, you know, I'd like to highlight um, the last conversation that um, DPA hosted was on COVID-19 and re-entry um, and uh, discussing many of the things that you had just brought up. So if people are interested in that, I would highly recommend uh, going and finding the recording of that conversation as well. Um, and uh, definitely, again, want to highlight the moment that we're in, both with COVID-19, but also with the, the brutal police killings that uh, have sparked all these uprisings across the country, righteous, righteously so. Um, so uh, I want to come back to that a little bit later and talk about how we should be nuanced in, when we're talking about reallocation of funding. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'd like to now go to Anjali um, to have uh, her talk about how these policy changes are playing out for her in the, on the ground. Um, you know, particularly in prescribing of, of, of buprenorphine, um, but uh, in general for all your services, um, how have the policy changes at the federal level allowed you to provide better services? And what barriers, barriers do you still face? Any, any federal or state um, or insurance barriers um, and any lessons that you've learned in providing services during this time? Uh, so, Anjali, take it away. And if you could unmute yourself, please. Sorry. Thank you so much, Kellen. Um, again, gratitude for the ability to be on this webinar and to work with uh, the Drug Policy Alliance in this way. So, my name is Anjali Taneja. I'm a family physician and the executive director of a nonprofit integrative um, primary care clinic um, that's a grassroots clinic called Casa de Salud in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and a lot of my life's work has been around building systems that are much more responsive to communities and all the ways that Kima spoke about. Um, and also in working with others who are passionate about transforming the medical industrial complex in the ways that we in medicine also, um, unfortunately, are so tied to the justice system and other systems that we also um, are responsible for transforming and shifting. So right now I'm sitting in the, the, the healing room at our clinic, Casa de Salud, and behind me is an altar that we use um, in some of our work with um, folks dealing with opioid addictions, um, not in a religious way, but in um, holistic healing and um, mind, body, and soul uh, approach to our work. So our organization started about 15 years ago and has, has grown from there. We're not a federally qualified health clinic. We're a nonprofit um, working to adapt and respond um, nimbly to the needs of, of our community. And we're deeply rooted in our community. The, the ways that Kima spoke about that, you know, we need to not be just talking about treatment, but about all services. Um, we, we aim to continue to do that work in, in every thread of what we do. Um, we, we have 20 employees, including 10 clinicians, Western medicine, docs, NPs, PAs. Um, as well as uh, Reiki master, massage therapists, um, doctor of oriental medicine, and a curandera, a traditional Mexican healer. And we have an apprentice program of 30 student volunteers who commit up to 500 hours um, in a year and who are primar primarily um, young women of color interested in the health professions. And we're doing some pipeline work and disruptive work around shifting who gets to become doctors and uh, nurses and, and other um, healthcare providers. Um, and so we do primary care, um, opioid addictions treatment. We run a syringe exchange um, out of our clinic. Um, it's the busiest syringe exchange in the South Valley of Albuquerque. And we're so grateful to the New Mexico Department of Health for partnering with us for 15 years and doing that work. We also do a lot of Narcan distribution. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then integrative healing with the modalities that I named, um, including acupuncture, massage, Reiki, curanderismo, and um, ear acudetox for folks dealing with withdrawal, stress, sleep problems. Um, we primarily serve uninsured patients. Um, that's about 70% of the people that we serve. So we're filling a gap. Um, we also primarily serve people with Medicaid. And then many of our um, patients are from populations that have been marginalized by various systems, including healthcare itself. Um, and we serve a fair amount of folks who are queer or seeking transgender um, health services for gender affirming healthcare um, and hormone therapy. We work with a lot of formerly incarcerated community members, um, um, a lot of Spanish, monolingual Spanish speaking patients and um, many people who are undocumented. So we have a, a, an addictions kind of program that is very much integrated in our primary care work. 
and we had built a lot of different um, shifts in our program before COVID hit, so um, we weren't expecting a pandemic, but we feel like we haven't necessarily changed too much radically with COVID hitting, but it makes me think about what other systems have had to shift and the ways in which our shifts have impacted our, our patients. Um, we're in New Mexico where the, the problems of heroin addiction, again, problematic use of drugs, um, have gone on for generations, way, beyond, way before the, um, the pharmaceutical um, industry involved and doctor involved crisis of the opioid crisis kind of formally started in the 90s. Um, and we have generations of addictions here, um, generations of intergenerational uh, trauma, poverty, uh, racialization of care, criminal justice system. We have the highest um, percentage of private for-profit uh, prisons um, in the country um, here in this state. And um, we, we know that we need to build systems that work for folks. So we come from this place of our, our, our values are based in anti-racism, cultural humility, and agency. And agency is a big one for our patients, especially coming to um, seek Suboxone or buprenorphine for treatment of opioid addiction. Um, so many people have entered or been a part of the um, justice system or the criminal uh, justice system and um, have been prescribed what they have to do or they have very specific rules of what, what they can do or they can't do. Um, they come out into the community and pursue treatment for addictions and are often given these very arbitrary rules of what they must do in order to stay in treatment um, that are not based in science, that are not based in healing, that are um, traumatizing or shame inducing. And shame is such a big part of why people are triggered in the first place um, as trauma is an underlying factor for drug use. So um, they're, they're not helpful little healing systems. And you know it's really curious who they are there to serve and what our own moral um, judgments as healthcare providers and as um, folks in various different systems, including criminal justice, um, po you know, put onto patients. So agency, the ability for someone, and Kima referred to this, but the ability for someone to make their own decisions and choose their own recovery path is really, really important for us. So we're an opt-in program. Folks can start, they, they come to us saying, I want to start on, on buprenorphine. They, can start on the medicine and we basically say kind of come for the suboxone stay for everything else anything else that you want to and so folks uh, access primary care here um, all of our integrative services are entirely free all you would like as many massages acupuncture um, reiki as you would like for your healing or none if you decide you don't want to do that um, and and we have very strong case management here um, as well as a syringe exchange and narcan distribution for folks who need um, in regards to Narcan, I just want to name that in this time of COVID, um, we, we only have preliminary data right now, but before COVID started, um, about um, one in every three Narcan units uh, uh, that was distributed to people in the community um, from our clinic was reported to be used in saving someone else's life. Um, that in and of itself is something that makes me emotional because that is such like people saving each other's lives with the tools that they need um, in, in, in their communities and supporting their friends and families. And if we look at the preliminary data that we have for May, it looks like that number was doubled. So two out of every three um, Narcan units that was distributed was used to save someone else's life. Um, we know that relapses, um, opioid overdoses, um, isolation, stress, all of that is contributing to a worsening crisis in many ways. And many of our patients have reflected to us that their, um, you know, social isolation is triggering. The fact that they can't get jobs right now is really triggering. Uh, one of our patients told us that I've come so far in my treatment and my recovery and I feel like I'm not where I need to be because now all these old triggers of I can't get a job, I'm not worth this or that, and I'm financially strained in this time um, are, coming, are coming back. Um, we also have uh, patients who have, have stated that they're really worried about going out and buying drugs, they're really worried about um, injecting in this time. They're taking all kinds of precautions, but these things are really worrying them. So the need or the desire for um, this life-saving treatment, buprenorphine, which has shown to decrease opioid overdose deaths by 50%. I don't, I don't know of many other drugs that have that kind of a, 
um, important benefit and life-saving benefit. Um, that's the, the need for that, the desire for that has gone up significantly uh, um, that we've seen. Um, also, we, uh, we work with, we have in the past worked with our, our patients in various different types of leadership development work. Um, last year, we ran a popular education workshop series that our patients basically delivered to folks in the community who were using drugs um, around the history of the drug war, um, around resilience, storytelling, different things like that, um, that was very impactful. Um, and we plan to continue doing work like that, but it's kind of, these are pieces of the work that we did before. And now in the time of COVID, we have had to move so significantly to telehealth for safety um, and for being good <laughs> healthcare providers. We are really grateful to our state Medicaid system. And I know that this is not something that is necessarily the case in many other states or in all other states around the nation, but New Mexico's Medicaid um, division moved extremely quickly in March to put out directives to Medicare, um, Medicaid care organizations stating that they must reimburse um, clinicians at the same exact rate for a phone visit as for an in-person visit or a telehealth visit. Um, and so that, that has been really huge for us to be able to reach our patients who don't have all the technology necessarily needed to do telehealth visits. But a lot of folks are really excited about that too. Um, we've seen, we've been doing so much less um, in-person care, so much more telehealth and been finding really great ways of doing that. I mean, even if we want to observe someone taking their Suboxone, if they're like, I want this accountability, you know, keep me on track, we can do so with a video call on someone's phone. Um, and it's helping us also reflect on, you know, maybe we could decrease how many times we have people give urine drug samples, like ways for us to check ourselves. Um, and then I know in other states um, in New York, the Bellevue Clinic in LA, there's a phone consultation program with the county where people can start on Suboxone entirely by phone and all their visits are by phone. SAMHSA has changed this and really allowed this to happen, which is phenomenal. And we can really look at the um, opportunities to to what, what do we want to keep from this um, going forward and how do we want to make sure, you know, make that happen. Um, I realize that my time may be up, so I'll share more um, as we go on. Thank you, Anjali, for uh, giving us a really, uh, uh, you know, quick overview of all the services that you provide. Um, sounds like you're doing great work there. Um, I'm going to turn now to, to Rupa. Um, and I, I want to get sort of the same, ask you sort of the same questions that I asked Anjali. Um, and get your take on what's happening uh, where you live in Kansas. Um, so how, are, how have you adapted to providing services to, to people during this time? And, and in particular, um, since you uh, work at a facility that is able to prescribe methadone, um, how has your uh, experience differed in prescribing that drug, especially with what Kima set up at the beginning and the difference between how that is treated versus buprenorphine? Um, hi there. Um, my name is uh, Rupa Sati. I work at uh, KU Addictions Clinic, um, as we call it. So it's uh, Kansas University Medical Center, and it's in Kansas. So we are located right in the Midwest. Um, our addictions clinic is a little different, where we have an integrated methadone clinic, and we have a, a separate uh, Suboxone clinic as well, or buprenorphine clinic, as we should call it. Um, we also run a Vivitrol clinic, um, which is mostly more for alcohol use disorder. And in some cases, we have had a few patients uh, with opioid use disorder who have transitioned from either methadone or buprenorphine got, get into the Vivitrol clinic as well. And then, of course, we have other um, patients from uh, different, using different drugs as well who come to our clinic and get counseling services. Um, we have had a different experience uh, when, has, uh, when it has come to COVID-19. Um, before COVID-19, it was all in-person visits. As COVID-19 hit, uh, we have transitioned to totally telehealth visits and telephone visits. And um, I sat with my counselors this morning. So how the methadone clinic in our uh, program works is we have counselors um, that help the, help the methadone patients. We have a social worker that helps us with the buprenorphine and uh, we help provide services to them. Um, couple of barriers um, that we have seen with buprenorphine treatment during COVID-19 was, uh, one of all was uh, the patients did not have uh, medications available at the pharmacies. Um, 
And that was because either the pharmacies did not have enough medication stored to them, or some of the pharmacies um, we did not have enough stock for the patients. And that was a huge barrier for some of our patients. It was also a lot of work for us because the patient would come and see us and then would call back and say, it was, we electronically send out prescriptions and then would call and say, um, the pharmacy does not have enough prescription. I'm going to run out my medications. You need to have to send it to another pharmacy, which was another problem. Um, another financial barrier that we have had is some of the pharmacies stopped accepting GoodRx coupons. Um, I don't know if how many of you have used GoodRx coupons, but a lot of my patients use GoodRx coupons. And, um, and as a result, because either they were uninsured or they did not have money and they were uh, using those good RS coupons and the pharmacies were not accepting them anymore. Um, as far as with the clinic was concerned, we were not able to do urine drug testing. So we were not, uh, we didn't know how the patients were doing. Um, but really when I saw the patients over and over again, uh, we realized that the patients just by seeing us over tele telehealth or telephone visits were actually doing okay as compared to in the past when we were we had them come in and do more urine drug screens so maybe we have to reassess the whole thing about urine drug screening and see if it has holds as much value um, as compared to when the programs don't have urine drug screening um, the other problem that uh, was with before COVID-19 hit, before March, we were totally in-person visits, and then we moved to totally telehealth visits. And a lot of physicians um, actually, you know, dealt with the problem of using telehealth services. And similarly for patients, patients also dealt with the problem of how do I get this telehealth visit? So we used either Zoom platform or we used the, uh, a platform Doximity. Um, and sometimes the patients will not have a smartphone Sometimes the patients would have a smartphone, but they would not know how to use it. So a lot of our telehealth visits got converted to telephone visits. However, as a clinic, we were able to still able to provide prescription to the patients. And overall, the patients did well. Now, a couple of months down the lane, when we look at patients, they're actually do, doing fairly well. Um, I'll jump over to methadone. In methadone, um, we had a couple of barriers. One of the barriers was group therapy. Uh, patients could not log into the groups. And so um, a lot of counselors, and I don't know how much of you uh, have uh, had this problem, but a lot of counselors could not have group therapy at all. Um, they were able to do one-to-one -one counseling, uh, but some of them, they said that they could not pick up non-verbal cues. So it was not very effective. However, um, a lot of uh, people felt that um, that overall the patients did well, even in the methadone clinic when they didn't come. As a state, um, in the state of Kansas, we were allowed to give them up to 28 days of prescription if they were stable or 14 days. Um, in our clinic, we chose that we will give them about seven days of prescription and then um, for the non-stable non ones and for the stable ones, we'll give them up to 14 or three weeks of prescription. And when I say prescription, I mean methadone dispensing or take home carries. And um, most of the patients did well with that as well. Um, I think those were most of the um, barriers that we had. Um, there were a couple of things that we found that could be very helpful for the methadone patients. Um, this was a good change where the platform could be moved from daily uh, dosing as compared to more infrequent dosing. Um, most of the counselors and our clinic manager and, you know, most of the people that I've talked to, they've experienced that patients who had accountability, patients who had the motivation to do well, did not need to come in every day and actually did well even when, we took, when they took one week home carries or even longer. Um, and they realized that maybe this might be a change that could be made in the long run because um, these patients were doing fairly well. And they do not, people who have accountability, people who are, who are motivated to treatment might be on the discretion of the clinic or discretion of the physician or the discretion of the clinician working with them and have more carries, which would help them in the long run. Um, the other thing that we also th thought was for these patients in the methadone clinic, um, some of them were even dosed in the cars, um, especially the ones who were exposed to COVID, who had an exposure, who tested positive for COVID, and that was really good. 
uh, we did, um, so the patient had come to the uh, clinic parking lot and they were dosed in the car and that really worked well, uh, well with the patients. And rest of them, they came in and they were dosed in the clinic. Um, and then um, I think the only challenge that we thought as for methadone was that because the physical examination was mandated, um, the patient had to come in and that kind of exposed um, a lot of staff and patients. Um, but because methadone is something that causes, um, you know, has uh, problems with uh, comorbidities and uh, can cause QTC prolongation. So um, uh, it is a challenge when the methadone patients are there, when they come into the clinic um, and as compared to buprenorphine when they didn't have to come in for a physical examination. I think that's all from my end. Great, thank you so much, Rupa. Um, yeah, and then again, you know, going back to what Kimo was saying at the beginning, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know if amazing is the word because we all know why, but the, the difference in the treatment between uh, methadone and buprenorphine, um, even though we know that both medications are effective for, for, for treating opioid use disorders. So thank you. Um, so, so next we're gonna go to, um, to Lisa. Um, and, uh, and again, we'd love to hear your personal experience about how uh, providing services has changed during COVID, uh, particularly for the populations that you serve, where um, most or all of the people have um, recent incarceration histories, um, in, particular, uh, in particular, the additional challenges that those populations face, and whether you've seen um, any changes to the way that the criminal legal system is uh, dealing with uh, mandated treatment um, for your populations that you are serving. Great, thank you for having me. I just wanna take a minute and say, I'm, it's a real honor to be here speaking with this phenomenal panel and learning uh, from all of you. And uh, to have this opportunity to sort of give a voice to the experiences of, of the patients I've cared for over the past decade. Um, and really sort of how their experiences have changed in, in these times. So, you know, the lens I bring to this conversation is that um, I am a primary care provider. Uh, and so I've worked in, in OTPs in the past, but I really focus my work now in, in the primary care setting. And because of that, take a, a really sort of deep investment in looking at addiction as a the chronic care model that I think it ought to be approached with. Um, and looking at drug use in a really broad way, like Dr. Taylor said, right, and, and you mentioned too in the intro, like not everybody needs help or wants help, but might need something, you know, and, and ought to be able to access that and how they want to. Um, so I'd say a couple things, and I've just been thinking about this so much, and how do you kind of group these take-home messages and all these changes together? I think one of the biggest one that, that kind of has stuck with me is this role of decreased surveillance. And I, I say that because, you know, in, in many ways, and for many and most of the patients I care for, our health system practices and um, treatment services have very much mirrored the surveillance of criminal justice, exper uh, criminal legal system experiences, right? We're often like very much the same. Um, you know, lest we think we're, you know, benign in this whole scenario. And I don't think you see that anywhere as starkly clear as with uh, regulations around medications for opioid use disorder. I mean, it is so much surveillance, right? It's really built upon surveillance and this like really distorted hierarchical thing where you have to like get started and then you have to be good. And if you're good, then you're gonna get a prize. And that prize is gonna be an extra day of your life back that you don't have to travel on a couple buses and wait in a line where there's no anonymity. Everyone knows why you're in that line. The entire community walking by knows and you have zero protection to know that of your like private health scenario, right? And so, you know, I think of this, what, what's happened is decreased surveillance. Like that's really how I think about it. You suddenly have OTBs, like, you know, giving 14 to 28 day take home bottles to really everybody, right? You didn't have to win the prize and like behave well 
uh, in order to get this reward. And um, it, I mean, literally decreased surveillance with like not checking in as much, not as frequent urines, um, but also like not experiencing the way people talk to you uh, sometimes in treatment centers and, you know, all of that stuff. And so I think that that from speaking with my patients, like that has had a really positive effect on some people. Like I really have people saying to me, like, I am just so relieved that I don't have to go in for a urine check right now. I'm so tired of that, right? Or like, I am relieved I don't have to figure out childcare today. Cause like that was getting to be really tough. Like I don't have anyone to watch my kids and having to go down and, and you know, get medicated every day in person is just not working for me, right? Um, and so I think the decreased role of surveillance of the medical system has been a really positive, you know, change that's happened um, with, with um, these, this change in regulations at the federal level. Um, and, you know, I, I just think that it's important. It's, I think it's infantilizing, you know, the, the way this entire system is typically set up. And uh, there is a real sense of relief amongst many people who, who were seeking treatment for a long time, despite, you know, like kind of against all odds, like despite this situation where it was never set up to make them feel empowered. Um, and yet they kept doing it you know, because they wanted it or valued it or it brought some other benefit to them or they had to because they were forced to, you know, if they wanted to stay in the community. So it's complex, but I've heard a sigh of relief, you know, amongst many of my patients when it comes to that. And um, I'd say that I feel that for them too. And in some ways, you know, we have also seen some decreased surveillance literally on the surveillance side of things, which is, you know, community supervision and probation and parole. So um, in Connecticut, um, they were pretty quick to really suspend in-person, uh, you know, really limit in-person probation and parole uh, visits and to limit um, urine drug screens. Um, and again, a real sigh of relief there for many of my patients. Like, you know, clearly. Um, and I feel that too, because I got to say, like, it gets really old to be someone who's, you know, been trained, like ha addiction boarded, like has a treatment plan going, work with a whole team, the community health workers out in the community, really working with somebody on getting housing or food or helping them find childcare. And they're doing like pretty pretty well, like they're happy, they're looking for some work, they reconnected with their son, they, you know, are on buprenorphine and using cocaine like once a week. And suddenly this person is like swooped away into an inpatient non-evidence-based treatment program because of a, a urine toxicology result. No one consulting me, no one consulting really anybody. And this is by non-health-based people, right? This is like non-public health trained um, arms of the correctional system. And that is, you know, the, me finding it old is the least of the problems, right? But I'll say on the provider end, that gets really old, you know? And on the, on the person end, that is like about a thousand times worse. Um, so I, I, I would say that decreased surveillance has in some ways like on the treatment end has allowed me to just practice medicine, you know, like, or build deeper relationships because some, you know, people know that you, you're not, your plan with them is not the ultimate plan when there's the surveillance arm above them that can pluck them at, at you know, with the, a change in the way the wind is blowing. Um, and I do find that it undermines very legitimate deep care plans, right? Like, you can come up with the most holistic plan in the world, but when someone knows that you're not really ultimately, like you might not even be able to implement that because they can just be plucked out, like it, it, it limits engagement to some degree, I think. And so we have never been able to see the full realization of deep community treatment for anybody under supervision, 
where they really know what they're actually up against. And it's something that's not in all, any of our control, right? A, a lot of my conversations are spent saying that with people. Like, I get this, you're right. It's not, you know, I'll do anything to advocate. I call probation officers really every single day when somebody wants me to write letters, do legal work around it. Like, I will do that and we do that all the time. And yet we're still not ultimately in control of what the outcome is. So I think it allows to some level, there's a lot of promise there in decreased surveillance. I think it allows like the real potential, hopefully to be realized in the future of what with the proper resourcing and all of that, like what deep community treatment can really be about for people who have criminal legal system involvement and what they really deserve, right? Like not to have that looming threat above them. Um, other take home thoughts. So I have seen, I, I think a lot more increased flexibility and coordination of care that I've, I've fought for, for a decade and really never seen to this level. And suddenly everybody's coordinating, which, you know, I'm not going to diss, like I, it, it is phenomenal, but you're like, really? Like you changed it that fast. Like I have been emailing you for 10 years. <laughs> um, but so in Connecticut, um, <clears throat> in addition to running my clinic, I've led an expansion of our, in our state of transitions clinics in other cities. So we have an, a statewide network that can address the needs more broadly of people going back to different locations when they come home. And what we did was we set up a statewide hotline uh, to get to exactly what Dr. Taylor was talking about, which is like, I wrote an op-ed about release everybody. I fully believe it. Like I fully believe that the only way, one of the primary ways to mitigate the spread of COVID in correctional systems and in communities that have correctional systems is to release people. And to that end, we've been actually studying it and we'll publish it very soon. And the evidence supports this. I'll sort of early view to the, to the science, but you know, I have pushed for it. And then I've also said, and it's an and, not an or, right? Like, so it's not like you don't release people if there's nothing in the community. No, they still ought to be released. And you need a community that's robust enough to care for them. And people mobilize, right? Like when push comes to shove, there you can find great people who are trying to do great stuff. And it's all about kind of harnessing that energy and bringing it together. But you devastating things happen to people when they're released. The risk of death after release, even if you don't have a substance use disorder, is astronomical. There's almost no condition in medicine that students learn about ever that carries, that confers that high a risk of death of leaving a correctional system. You could go into the hospital with a heart attack and you walk out of that hospital, your risk of death is not as high as somebody who walks out of a correctional system. And so I fully, I couldn't, you know, stand with Dr. Taylor any more strongly that you need this robust community system. And that system needs communication. Like we can't operate in a bubble. You know, we're out here and people come home and there's this much communication about what happened to them inside. That's a, that should be illegal, right? Like that should be so, considered so unprofessional that nobody would do that. We don't send people out of the hospital without a communication to somebody out there like, hey, P.S., here's what happened in here, in this, you know, bubble. Like, this is what actually happened to this person. We need the same thing. And it gets to addiction treatment as well. Like, what did you all do for this person when they were in there? I don't need to recreate the wheel. And when you get to the abysmal um, lack of MOUD treatment programs in correctional facilities, though it's growing, it's still at a alarmingly low you know, availability. But one of the major barriers is communication, right? And how we, this distorted crazy thing where you can't respect what another provider has diagnosed the person with is and you have to go diagnose them all over again, right? That should be no such thing, right? Like if you have an OUD and you're on methadone, I'm just gonna believe you had an OUD enough that someone out there put you on methadone, right? Like why do we need an entire new physical, this blood work, 
a, a, you know, communication with the place. Like this should be accessible information the same way you can go in a PMP and like check out, you know, prescription monitoring program and check out whether someone's on buprenorphine. You should be able to easily check that someone's on methadone and just continue the therapy, right? Like there shouldn't be a five day delay when they go into jail or a five day delay when they come home where they have to go through literal physical agony of withdrawal just to stay on a life-saving medication. Um, we should see that as an absurdity and we should see any lack of coordination that allows that as health harming and absurd. Um, and so I think that this increase in data sharing and flexibility and coordination of care in the time of COVID has been amazing in some places, like really amazing. You know, I've been on phone calls with now because of this hotline with, you know, the head of, uh, of con the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness, who's there, you know, we're advocating for money from the state. They got the money. They started putting people in hotels when they came home who didn't have a better place to go or a safe place to go. Uh, we started getting them, you know, appointments or just saying like, hey, I don't even need to see you in person, like let's do a phone visit, right? And so all of that um, is, is, has come out of the need of, of coronavirus and, and, and what it brought, but is stuff that should be absolutely continued and built upon in the future. It's really just at a fledgling phase now, but I think a take home message is not to ever allow it to go in reverse. You don't, you know, collaborate and create coordination and then eliminate that collaboration. You know, you just can't, can't go in reverse. Um, and so we should take steps that secure those sorts of um, increased communication, data sharing, um, and like inter and intra agency and, and um, healthcare establishment talk. I think it's critical. Um, I think is my time up. Yes, uh, I, I think we'll we'll have more opportunity to, okay. to chat about the ideas that you've raised. But thank you so much, uh, Lisa. I, I, I believe you really laid out the case there um, for uh, for care for people with incarceration and, and this broader issue. And I want to move um, now to to have uh, Richard talk. Um, one of the things that was often left out of this conversation, particularly since the so-called opioid crisis hit the media waves is, uh, you know, people who use drugs that are not opioids and services that they might want to use. Um, and so Richard, I would really appreciate it if you could walk us through um, some of the other treatment options that are available for um, people who use other types of drugs, particularly stimulants, and what are the barriers to accessing effective forms of treatment um, for those, for the people that use those drugs. Thank you, and I appreciate being invited to participate. I've been really fascinated to hear my colleagues talk about the adaptations they're making in uh, providing treatment for people with OUD. It's really remarkable the changes that have happened so, well, relatively quickly in, in uh, the adaptation of medication treatments, as well as the, as Dr. Taylor pointed out, the additional changes that have occurred in response to COVID and how much more flexible we can be in providing uh, treatment to people with OUD. The situation with stimulants is real different. Um, I can't tell you about my practice of seeing patients. I'm, I live in Vermont. I, I, uh, my job now is mostly working with about 12 states and helping them develop treatment for stimulant use disorders. And um, this all started four or five years ago and uh, I'm now doing Zoom calls all the time on how to set up treatment, what is treatment, what are the priorities of treatment for patients with stimulant use disorders, um, what should we be doing, what, what should the treatments be. First off, as I was listening to my colleagues talk about their practices and their approach to working with patients with opioid use disorders, I was really struck by their um, natural acceptance of um, flexible treatment goals, harm reduction, if you want to refer to it as that, but a much more uh, uh, accepting and humane um, 
set of treatments that are more person-centered, even with the restrictions of the methadone regulations and buprenorphine regulations, their practices obviously are providing people with an array of treatments and with an array of treatment goals. On the behavioral treatments for stimulant use disorders, until very, very recently, the treatments, quote unquote, not harm reduction, but the treatments were very abstinence oriented, exclusively abstinence oriented. And the first thing I've had to do in this consultation uh, work is to introduce this whole idea of having patient-centered treatment that is um, responsive to what patients want from treatment, not what the protocol is that they're imposing on the, on the patient. That's a brand new concept for many of the people I'm working with in many of the states that um, are struggling with uh, large amounts of uh, patients using stimulants. And you really have um, three different batches of, of individuals with stimulant use disorders. You have the people walking in looking for specialty care for their cocaine or methamphetamine disorder. Or you have people who are on buprenorphine or methadone who are also using cocaine and methamphetamine. And what do you do for treatment for that population? And finally, the population that we have absolutely no data to guide us on at all are people walking into primary care who are using stimulants, cocaine and methamphetamine, and who are not there for treatment for their stimulant use disorder, but who are using stimulants and it's affecting their life and it's affecting their uh, well-being. And we have no protocols of any kind to um, identify um, uh, and address those issues. I'm gonna talk mostly about uh, specialty care right now because I've got a limited amount of time. Um, but the, um, the behavioral treatments we have that we're training and talking to states and their provider systems about include things like motivational interviewing, which as far as I can tell, should be put in the drinking water of um, every place because it's just a, an, an essential re reorientation of many of our old time clinicians to working with patients in a humane and patient centered way. So that's just a given. We do have some data on cognitive behavioral therapy and on um, community reinforcement approach that have some good solid data on their value for working with patients with stimulant use disorders. By far the best data we have and the most robust data, and there have been five meta-analyses on this in the last three years, is contingency management for, for the treatment of patients with stimulant use disorders. Contingency management works, it's very effective, um, and it's being used almost not at all in the United States because of a whole variety of um, uh, patient, uh, staff um, attitudes about I sh we shouldn't be incentivizing people using incentives and giving them uh, gift cards or giving them vouchers or putting them in situations where they can earn things for participation in treatment. Um, there's also, where do you get the money to do this? And there's a huge obstacle, um, which are the Medicaid regulations in blocking the use of contingency management. Just very briefly, contingency management is a very simple concept. It is providing people with incentives to help them make behavior change. This is done in combination with what they wanna change what kinds of things they're interested in changing in their behavior, whether it's reducing their stimulant use or finding a way to um, use stimulants in a less harmful way or however you want to frame it. But contingency management is about providing incentives for doing that. And that's what I'm spending a lot of time with these states is helping them develop um, strategies that incorporate contingency management given these regulations that are making them very uh, uh, challenging. Now this is all pre, these are all pre-COVID um, considerations. With COVID, we've had to try to move to use of some of these uh, distance uh, e-health technologies, things like uh, the work that's been done at Dartmouth on the chess uh, uh, system that is a 
a treatment system, a whole comprehensive treatment system that can be accessed online. Um, Reset, which is a specific behavioral tool that incorporates contingency management and is done all over a smartphone and uh, can be done uh, through an app. Another one's called Dynamic Care, which is also uh, app-based. All of these, I think, have tremendous potential to be uh, uh, used as, in the addressing uh, stimulant use disorders, but it's they're just getting off the ground and getting these apps into um, use really is a big lift. And we're, we're trying to do that. West Virginia, for example, is doing a big project with uh, Dynamic Care for their stimulant uh, patients with stimulant use disorders. And uh, uh, South Dakota is doing a big project with uh, contingency management in, among their uh, methamphetamine, uh, patients using methamphetamine and so on. And there are various stages around the country, but um, for me in working with these much less medically oriented treatment practitioners, mostly counselors, mostly um, sort of traditional treatment programs. The biggest message I have to bring to them is getting people engaged in a process of service uh, to address their stimulants is the most important thing and retaining them is, is, is an incredibly important tool. Regardless of how they're doing, maintaining a relationship with them, a connection with them, providing them with some contact and support is really the sort of the fundamental thing that we're needing to do with these stimulant users. We have no medicines, we have no buprenorphine or methadone to help really uh, hold them in treatment. And so the sort of changing the attitude of many of the behavioral counselors away from, we have a program, you have to do our program. Um, if you don't like our program, go somewhere else to, we have a range of options. Um, one of the options, in addition to these therapies I talked about, is physical exercise. We've got some really good data with uh, stimulant use disorders that physical exercise can help reduce many of the symptoms of uh, withdrawal and help with some of the uh, uh, more challenging uh, physical symptoms, craving, depression, anxiety, those things. Exercise can be very useful. But working with these treatment programs and how to blend all of these things and bring in some way of doing contingency management, some aspect of contingency management, even if it's not a full robust contingency management protocol, is really essential because those incentives in contingency management are really, really valuable in keeping people, in getting them engaged and keeping them coming back over the course of participation and treatment. I'd just like to close with a comment about Dr. Uh, Taylor's comments. Um, as I go around the country talking about uh, stimulant treatment, the boogeyman right now is uh, methamphetamine. Methamphetamine, methamphetamine, it's the worst thing that ever happened. It's a terrible thing in all of, all of our states. If you look at the overdose data related to stimulant use, there's higher rates of overdose deaths related to cocaine. However, the big difference between the populations using cocaine and methamphetamine is almost exactly Methamphetamine is uh, rural, tends to be white and Hispanic. Cocaine tends to be urban and much uh, higher proportion of African Americans. For some reason, that problem is no longer on the radar of many of the uh, policymakers. The, there's this hysteria almost over methamphetamine and uh, cocaine has been, um, is being nearly ignored in many of these parts of the country. So. One of the things I've been spending a lot of time with these states doing is um, emphasizing the need to work on stimulant treatment, psychostimulants, including cocaine and methamphetamine, and adding these new treatments to um, all the communities, not just the communities using uh, methamphetamine, where, where there's high methamphetamine rates. I'll stop there so that there's time for questions. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, but before we move on, I just wanted to ask you one question. Um, you know, if the, if the evidence base for contingency management is so good, why aren't more people using it? Uh, two th well, staff attitude, you shouldn't pay people for uh, being in treatment or it's somehow wrong that they're, you're using an external incentive. That's one. That's less than it used to be. The second one is where do you get the money? 
Where do you get the money to buy the incentives or where's the funding gonna come from? And the third one is for patients who are on Medicaid, there is a Medicaid federal rule that says you can't give patients on Medicaid incentives above $75 a year because it's that turns above that turns it into a kickback and providers are can be sanctioned for that. I've worked on this for 20 years in Cal California. I worked with a lot of clinics and um, there were clinics using contingency management that had the uh, the I guess it was the FBI come in and threaten to uh, send people to jail because they were giving their patients kickbacks in the manner method of uh, contingency management. Currently working with Wesley Clark and a, a group of other people to get this changed. We're hoping to get a waiver in and there's been a lot of discussion about it because this tool, this method, contingency management, in my mind is to stimulants what buprenorphine and methadone are to opioids. I mean, it really is a robust treatment, but we're almost, it's almost impossible to use with most populations. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just have a few questions before we're going to open it up to the questions from the audience. Um, the one that I think that I want to start with is, uh, we, you know, we've talked a lot about the changes that have occurred and how they have um, improved access for some people. But I want to ask the question of who is being left out? Um, how are we going to make sure that we're reducing disparities as we continue to try and improve access? Um, you know, in the context of telehealth, that's great for people who have access to that and know how to use technology, but what about people who can't afford that or don't know how to use it? Um, and, and what about geographical disparities, um, or urban versus rural areas? Uh, so I, I pose the question to the group, um, you know, who's being left out of these changes that we're making and how do we address that? Um. Can I, uh, can I jump in? And yes, please. Words? So um, in our clinic, um, we actually um, have a lot of uh, older populations so, and we also have pregnant women that come to our clinic um, that we have felt, um, especially the older population is the one um, that has been affected by COVID-19. Uh, a lot of them still have flip phones um, and uh, they do not have the technology that is needed to do Zoom or other, uh, or even a Doximity call or any other platform that we could use. So we've been calling them over the phone. They're very stable people, I know, um, who, and some of them are the ones who were on opiates for long periods of time, and then over time uh, got a new provider or got a new physician and the opiates were just cut off cold turkey and had to uh, go to the streets to pick up medications. And uh, they literally developed opioid use disorder because of that reason, because they were not, they were cut off the medications all of a sudden. And they are now followed in our opioid use disorder clinic because they meet criteria for opioid use disorder. And um, very stable people, but they have kind of lost contact with the clinic because all they have is a flip phone. And it's difficult to pick up nonverbal cues. It's difficult to have a conversation for a long time over the phone. Counselors try to do it. I have a social worker, they try to do it. I have done it, but it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge uh, for them. And they are the ones that probably are affected by the COVID-19. I would also add in a caveat there too, that I think that sometimes we overemphasize the use of video. Like, this isn't studied. There's no data that shows that video that I'm aware of that sh shows that video is far superior than a phone call. And so while that deserves studying, I'm sure somebody out there is studying this as we speak and, and that's great. You know, we shouldn't over rely on fancy technology because it's fancy and seems like a good idea. Um, for some people, for many people, not everyone, a phone call uh, is, is, is still sufficient and they shouldn't just be like locked out of um, programs because they can't have a video feature. I would just like to add to that, in addition to phone calls, texting. Uh, for, we've, we've done a lot of work with adolescents um, uh, for aftercare as well as part of treatment and they tend to be more on social media or, and or texting than uh, doing calls. And they like, they like communicating by text. And it's, um, I think it has a lot of potential that we haven't really um, fully explored yet uh, uh, to be able to 
maintain a connection with them and to reach out to them via text and to provide them with messages of um, engagement and support. Um, so I agree. I don't think I don't think everything has to be telemedicine. I think there is a role for other methods as well. I think there's two two pieces I talk about. One, um, as Rupa was talking about, is pregnant women. And, I, and that is if a pregnant woman is, um, if she's pregnant, she gives birth, she's at risk of COVID, she's separated from the baby, bad enough, then you have substance use and child protective services that says you have to do a certain amount of things to be able to get your baby back. And so that I think is a real crisis. And again, it has that disproportionate impact that we need to talk about and look closely at um, as we move past COVID. And so definitely I would say pregnant women. But the other piece, honestly, is there's so many, so many people left out. And part of that is also that a lot of the really cultural effective on the ground practitioners that do a lot of this work were left out, right? So they were left out of some of the PPE requirements. They were left out of some of the um, foundation giving that allowed their clients to have um, free phones. I'm, I have a dear friend of a reentry organization and they're still doing the job. No one's paying them for it. Everyone's doing services. And so I think it's more, it's not just providers are great, but we have to think about all that other infrastructure that leads to people being left out even more than they would have because folks on the ground know how to reach people. It shouldn't, docs shouldn't presume and our clinic should presume that we have that capability. That's why we partner with people when we're face to face and those same organizations need funds so we can partner with them when we're on video or telephone. Um, but I do think, you know, it's interesting because I don't think there's enough data being collected. Pre-COVID, there's not enough stratification of data to understand. Like folks will say LGBTQ plus youth have higher rates of substance use, but will they build culturally effective programs? Not so much. And so we need that stratified data to know better and to be able to make arguments for what's working. But something that Lisa said on the call, which I'm going to say because she didn't bring it up now, um, but so I'm stealing hers, but the reality is like you wish this experiment didn't have to happen with COVID, but if it's happening with COVID, we really need to collect some data and be able to say, not that it's going to be perfect, but what are we building on? What's working? What's not working? Let's revamp and, and figure out what works best because it real those who we're leaving out keeps me, keeps me awake at night. The homeless, I mean, just so many people. Thank you, Kima, for mentioning that. And I would just add really quickly and, um, that I also think that we all ought to think about the metrics that we will allow this to be measured by. And that they cannot be these metrics that we never agreed with in the first place that have been imposed for decades, right? So if anyone starts measuring people's urine after this and to see whether this grand experiment worked, you know, we should all lose it, you know, like, go streaking in the streets and join, you know, like, that's just not okay. Like, that's not a metric that we're going to allow to be used to measure the success of this kind of treatment experiment that we've been waiting for for years. And that happened during the worst time ever. Um, and also, we shouldn't be measuring the success of uh, deregulation or loosening of regulations in short periods of time like you know this should not be measured in the immediate like this is the worst time ever everyone's lost their job people are losing loved ones people have been ill people don't have food they don't have money to pay anything and then we're saying oh and how did you do with like not needing to go to get your methadone so much you know it's it's a it, it will be a mess if that's how we allow it to be measured and inconsistent what we, with what we really believe is happening and the real benefit of it. So like, what might we measure? What about civic engagement? Like, what if we measured how people did with, if we could increase voting rates amongst people, uh, to Kima's point, not just in treatment, but using drugs who are accessing health services in different ways. Like, what if we looked at civic engagement and said, how did we do in, you know, in increasing civic engagement because people were not under as these strict surveillance, you know, regu like really rigid regulations that were really never built for them to be successful in the first place. Um, so just adding that. Just a, a couple more thoughts, um, building on Lisa, what you said. I think this also provides an opportunity for us to fully revamp what metrics we always use. I mean, the, the, the initial metrics of 
adherence or of urine drug test results, all of those things are, are, are metrics that we have an opportunity to fully throw out um, if we're able to reimagine all of this. Um, so what can we take from that and really rethink what we want our metrics to be in the future? Our, we had a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholar Project here for three years working on addictions and civic engagement was one of the things that we looked at as um, you know, a, a better outcome or what we decided we wanted to look at instead of any numbers about what is what are archaic ways of looking at success. Um, I also want to say that in regards to what's being left out, I didn't mention this when I first spoke, but given we're such a high touch clinic that people can opt into acupuncture, massage, Reiki, all of the healing circles, groups, all of these things in a beautiful relational, you know, spiritual way, not having that in this time has impacted a lot of folks who are like, I didn't realize you know, how much having Reiki was helpful for my stress, um, how much having free massage, which you know, I don't have money and I would never otherwise have access to helped decrease my pain, which is a trigger for me using. Um, acupuncture, so many benefits that people get from building using that with Suboxone and other modalities and we don't have that ability to do that. Um, we, we decided to also see people in, in the clinic with all our precautions, PPE, PPE for patients, um, you know, temperature checks, symptoms, all of that, taking all the highest precautions, but seeing people in, in the clinic when we needed to, when people didn't have phones, you know, just to make sure that people were not being excluded from care if they could get here, but didn't have technology um, to help that. Um, also in New Mexico, there are whole entire counties. We're a large state that has only 2 million people population, but very large geographic distances between things. And there's entire counties where there aren't even one prescriber of Suboxone. So this opens up an opportunity, I think, with telehealth for existing um, clinics to look differently at what we do. And, and that is in part why it's that much more important to continue the changes that have happened so far into the future, while also training many more clinicians um, in how to, to prescribe these salts name those few things. Great. Thank you to you all. Um, I want to go back to something that Kima mentioned in, at the beginning, which was, uh, you know, in the wake of the, the police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and countless other black and brown bodies, you know, there's these calls for, re you know, defunding the police and reinvesting in social services. Social, social services is largely undefined in that call. Um, and in fact, some people might see taking funds away from police, uh, a good solution would be to put that into like mandated or coerced treatment. Um, so I am curious, uh, and maybe Akima, maybe you can take this first, is um, what should we be aware of in these calls and how can we complicate that narrative to make sure that we are actually investing um, in services that people, that communities need? Yeah, that worries me. Um, and, you know, part, I was having this conversation with some people earlier, and it's almost like how we more or less messed up justice reinvestment. No offense to was doing it. Um, and so if you don't really have the right framework, it, beca it becomes co-opted in a way that is really then detrimental and punitive to the very people you said you were trying to serve. And so I think one you need to be very thoughtful about the ask. And it's not, and I go back to Racial Justice Action Center, right? It's the people who are the most at risk and what do they need? And that is never rocket science because we all need it for ourselves. It's being able to articulate that it's needed and find the money to pay for it. Um, but that, so what's needed has been produced before. It's thinking thoughtfully how to pay for it and then partnering partnering with others who are in the same space. So as Lisa was saying, that coordination and the relationship needs to continue. You know, working with Health Care for the Homeless Sites and the Coalition for Homeless Care, working with street medicine groups, working with social worker groups that are on the same page and identifying what's needed. Because there's other pockets of money and there's, well, you know, like I hate to go deeply into the weeds, but one place is medicine is moving towards value-based payment. And I think that's an opportunity, again, if done right, that you can think about one, how to change the metrics around substance use, how to change and hold people accountable for equitable outcomes, um, but then also how to include services that are patient-centered. The conversation, it's social determinants of health. True believer in that, it's become bastardized to mean you get Uber or you get food, when it's really evaluating patients, knowing that the societal determinants of health have determined where they are and, and the system needs to be changed. 
And so I think it, I, I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. What I think we have to do is put the wheel together and have lots of people speaking to it. And then also that accountability measure that's, that's around, as Anjali was saying, around what we want to see and not letting that own the accountability. Like one thing that came out around health homes, people were like, let's have health homes that address substance use and have one of their outcomes be that they decrease recidivism. Like I'm a, there is no way as a doctor I can control someone arresting black people just because it seemed like the thing to do that day, right? So how is that an accountability measure? And again, as I said, for the justice system, it wasn't a treatment. It is not a measure that you should be measuring against. Um, and so I think it's putting in accountability measures and identifying accountability, accountability measures that are helpful for patients, families, and communities and getting them out there. But it needs to be a coalition of voices. No one's going to do it alone because we are up against uh, challenging policy times at this moment, shall we say. Um, and so it's really strategic partnerships and strategic communication and taking what's been done. We're not the first smart people to ever arrive on this planet. So taking that's what's been done and putting it in words for the moment. Would anyone else like to address that? Um, I, I'll, I'll say a few words. Um, it, building on what Kima said, uh, so important for us to yeah not replicate systems that exist. So if we're looking at shifting um, funding and sources, what are we looking at shifting to and how we need to understand more deeply how so many of our systems are involved in surveillance and so many of them are tied in some way to the criminal justice system and the racialized care that happens happens in every field and so there are nuances and, and ways that we need to ask of systems as there are changes being made um, to, to, to hold folks accountable and not replicate existing problems. I think one last thing is to also sort of really recognize that um, there are kind of non expensive interventions out there that are constantly depending on grant funding and stuff like that, but are proven to work. And so that's like an easy place to start, you know, is like actual sustained funding to really kind of inexpensive interventions that have really shown benefit. I think of a colleague of mine, Ayana Jordan at Yale, who's a, just a phenomenal um, psychiatrist who's built this program called um, Imani Breakthrough. And it's a faith-based faith intervention for um, Black and Latinx people with any substance use disorder that really integrates, you know, relationship with the church or their place of worship and but is like based on CBT and administered by trusted uh, people in the community, not by, you know, health professionals themselves, but trained people in the community who look like them are also going perhaps to that same church. And, you know, it, these sorts of interventions, which are um, tailored to different cultural needs, recognize and acknowledge racism and its in its role in, in substance use disorders. And, you know, these sorts of, of things are um, not rocket science, not inventing a whole new thing. And it's just funding, funding programs. Uh, I saw someone here in the comments about peers, like I do lots and lots of work with community health workers. There's great evidence for the role of peers and community health workers in tons of health interventions. And yet, there is almost no way to fund them through Medicaid. You know, it is so hard to, to fund a community health worker through Medicaid. And that's deeply, deeply unfortunate. It feels like a structural blockade that's been erected to keep people from the community out of getting funded. And, you know, it is a, another place to start, I think. I just add a, a piece to that because I also, um, I think we have to be very careful about cheap, cheaper um, systems and responses because a lot of people are doing things for labors of love and they need to be paid. And so one thing that has always worried me about some of the peer counseling, and it gets to what Lisa was saying, is it's not paid for by Medicaid. And so folks will use volunteer peers and not pay them while the rest of the system's getting paid. And it, it, it's, it's criminal. 
on one level, but it's also another way peers are used, right, is to diversify the workforce and, and keeping people at the lowest level, not providing a career ladder, not saying, hey, they don't want to be a peer, let's let them go be um, a TV studio person. Um, but so being very thoughtful, I think we have an opportunity of really thinking through as we say, yes, they need to be Medicaid reimbursed, making sure they're reimbursed at the right level. Like we need to take all of that in, in, um, into account, just building on what Lisa's saying. Cause that Medicaid is absurd, but if we're gonna get it, let's get it right. Great, thank you all so much. Um, we are going to move to the uh, audience Q and A section right now. So I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Lindsay to uh, facilitate that. Thank you so much. This has been a very thought provoking conversation evidenced by the number of questions that we have. So we will do our best to get to them. Um, we may not get to all, but we're going to start with some that are directed to all panelists and you can take it as you see fit. Monte asks, um, what can we do to ensure that the changes that we're seeing and the traction that has resulted from COVID-19 um, move beyond this moment um, and that there's sustainability built in um, so that it's not just in the moment of this crisis, but long term. Uh, why don't we start with Rupa since we haven't heard from you in a little bit, if that's all right. So um, if I get the question right, um, I think these changes uh, would be great if we can sustain them. I, uh, this was a great change that was made during that of the COVID-19 and um, some of the telehealth services, telephone services that came into effect. And I'm talking both buprenorphine side and uh, methadone sites, as, especially as well, has been a great change. Like counselors can uh, call the patient and make a phone check and make, make sure they're doing okay. And that counts and that's an accountability measure. And uh, people are getting more uh, take home carries for methadone specifically, for buprenorphine. Uh, also, they can either do telephone. I have a couple of patients who are on telephone. And I think these are the kind of changes that moving forward should be sustained. There should be a mixture of all of the things that can be brought in. So um, in, in person visits for people who need to come in, there are, there are patients that is, they say that they have felt social isolation and they need to come in at this time because the, the clinic was their support system. So they can be seen via that modality and keeping telehealth and telephone for people who are coming from far off. For example, um, in our methadone clinic and in the buprenorphine clinic, I have patients driving about three uh, hours to come see us in the clinic because we are in Kansas, that one facility that's accepting new patients and we have a couple of addiction psychiatrists there. So we are able to see these people and it is just bad for them to come in, drive three hours to come see us. But if this modality is there, like it has been for last few months, um, I these people are doing good. And one thing that I forgot to mention was I'm able to see their houses if they're on telehealth. I have, I, I and all the counselors and all the providers in our clinic have felt that this was awesome because uh, some people that we thought were really stable didn't look stable when we looked at their houses. Some of them we looked at their houses and saw we're like, okay, this person seems to be doing really well. I mean, the houses looked organized, the, you know, it, it was, it was well kept and um, it seemed like, the, you know, we could make some more advancements in treatment. Um, so overall, yes, it's a, it's a great mix that we should keep and we should sustain over time. Thank you. We've talked today about changes to practice, changes to policy as a result of COVID-19. Um, and Zachary would like to know as kind of frontline workers who are seeing the impacts of substance use disorder treatment and COVID-19, where do you think academics should direct their research effort in this moment? Why don't we start with Lisa on that one? If you don't mind. Yeah, great. I'll, um, off the top of my head, a couple of thoughts. So um, I think that work that involves people who are directly impacted by what we are doing, you know, uh, by COVID-19, um, by drug use, by incarceration, all of that um, is really critical. I think for way too long, we research things in bubbles uh, that are really never applicable to the communities that, that they intend to be applicable towards. And so I think 
uh, community-based true participatory research um, is a great skill to develop, one that I still, that I'm working on myself. And um, I think there's lots of room for professional development there in the, in, with the ultimate intention to get to like deep work with communities and having them actually really guide the research. Um, I think that's critical and there's a lot of opportunity uh, to develop those skills professionally and then to like really grow your research and, and have it impact a whole nother level because it was really foundationally driven by the people who themselves had the question, not what your question was, what their question was, and, and you helped the research. Um, so I think that's one place that comes to mind. Um, and then a lot of the things that we've talked about on this call, like, you know, the health disparities are glaring, totally not surprising, by design, have been there forever before, and ought to still be studied to like really call it what it is. Like the data, the data, the data to support it. Um, and then study different, you know, how some of these deregulations maybe improved outcomes for people differentially based on race, like all of that. I, I think there's a really rich um, opportunity of, of, for research there as well. Richard, I would love your thoughts on this question too. Well, uh, for me, the, I mean, we, we've done so much research on specific techniques and specific interventions and double blind trials and all that. But I mean, when you talk about the proportion of individuals with substance use disorders who are in contact with health services, you usually get down to a pretty small percentage. It's been remarkable to watch what's happened as buprenorphine has moved into primary care and has become much more widely available. And we're seeing in some places estimates of 50 and 60% of the people with opioid use disorders in treatment or in some kind of connected health service. Uh, that's never, we've never really studied the best ways of expanding access of doing a better job of engaging people. And some of these things like telepsychiatry, like uh, remote texting and phone calling and um, going out into the community with services um, haven't really been evaluated in the research world. They're done, but they're just not, they, they never make it inside the research bubble. And I think some of those issues on how to get these treatments out to more people in a higher proportion of people with substance use disorders is really uh, very studyable. It just hasn't been a priority. Thanks. We have a question from Nikki, who is wondering if in this moment, any of you have seen um, an increase or desire from your patients to transition to extended release buprenorphine um, or sublocaine? Uh, Anjali, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, we have, at Casa de Salud, we haven't seen a lot of interest in sublocaine, which is uh, in injectable in, in extended release suboxone. Um, the few folks who've uh, expressed interest um, have, um, we've kind of talked about like why they want to do that and we'll connect them to places that are doing that. We're aiming to do that, but we haven't started that yet um, in terms of systems and building that in. Um, but uh, yeah, and there, there I, I believe that someone from Sage Neuroscience is on this uh, webinar. Um, we've referred folks to them here um, for that, but we haven't seen an increase uh, number really in folks be before COVID pandemic hit to now um, who are looking at that. That's my anecdotal response. Thanks, Anjali. And why don't I stay with you? Because we have a question from Lori who talks about the alarming rates of COVID-19 in the Navajo Nation um, and wonders if there are any people or programs in Indian um, country across the U.S. that are responding innovatively to the challenges particular to this population. Yeah, so um, I can't speak too much to that. I work in, in an emergency room um, in the Navajo Nation um, once in a while, um, but 
I know that at the uh, at a nearby hospital to there um, at, at Gallup Indian Hospital, there are some incredible docs doing work um, with harm reduction and with um, opioid addiction and looking at creative ways to um, meet folks in this moment. Gallup was also a city that has um, gone through like several day entire lockdowns, like no one leaving um, the the city. Then that was highlighted in the, in the news nationwide. Um, and the folks there have been doing some incredible work in regards to um, housing people who have who are COVID positive, getting them the meds they need, um, folks being able to um, access alcohol if they need to, get syringes, things like that. Um, so there have been some creative approaches there, but that's probably what I can, a limited amount that I can speak to, but I know there's some um, really phenomenal things going around um, the nation. Thank you so much. We had a number of questions that were directed um, to Richard. One from Jesse is around um, safe supply or stimulant substitution for illicit stimulant users. I'll put a pin in that and just let all of you know that we are having a webinar on safe supply where we hope to dive more deeply into those issues and we'll certainly address that question. Um, Ryan, though, asks, um, why not use stimulant agonist therapies for stimulant use disorders? Um, and whether or not there's any data and research on how this works, um, in his personal experience, he's seen that off-label prescribing of stimulants has saved lives. And is that something that should be considered in this moment? Yeah, it is being, well, it, it, you know, the, our history of doing, uh, developing medications for particular uh, uses um, is to take them through clinical trials and evaluate whether or not they help the patient, whether they, uh, when you compare them to placebo, there have been a bunch of studies with uh, amphetamine uh, for cocaine and amphetamine for methamphetamine. And the results have been mixed. Some have been uh, very useful. I think it's a matter of um, patient, uh, there may be some specific groups of patients who really respond well to those. I think you will see in the next several years, um, amphetamine being getting an approval for the treatment of cocaine dependence at least. I don't know about uh, methamphetamine, but um, the, the, there have been several very uh, promising trials, but the way we develop medicines takes a while, and uh, as you can see from our, uh, our non-research uh, approach with hydroxychloroquine, um, you really do need to look at the medicines uh, and test them and make sure they actually do more than placebo before you um, use anecdotal evidence to, uh, to use them, and, but they are being, they are being tested. Thank you. And David asks whether or not we've seen any aggressive housing first efforts paired with meth treatment programming, but I think I'll broaden that question out. Um, so maybe Richard, you can start, but others can fill in about um, housing first models more broadly and, um, and permanent supportive housing and whether or not we're seeing an increase in um, services and care being integrated with housing, particularly as people's mobility is limited by COVID-19. So maybe Richard, you can start us off, but then I'd love for other yeah, there, to With in. methamphetamine, there definitely have been um, some projects. There's some in Los Angeles that are longstanding uh, projects of housing first for uh, stimulant users. I believe in, in Seattle, there have been uh, a number, and they, they have very uh, excellent promise. Unfortunately, they're not, housing first isn't the kind of uh, medical intervention that NIDA tends to fund very uh, often. And so they often don't get tested in um, what are considered legitimate research trials. And so they always stay in sort of that fuzzy land of, well, people think they're very useful, but we don't have good data on them. Uh, and we need good data on them uh, to uh, put them fully into the mainstream of approaches that we use for those patients. Because I think there's um, I think they do have incredible promise. And in these individual studies, they have shown very excellent promise for uh, use with stimulant users, at least. Would anyone else like to weigh in? I'm, I'm speaking anecdotally again from your experience um, of our years of doing work with community members. Um, someone getting a job um, that is meaningful and purposeful or getting housing um, has consistently been something that we have seen has helped folks 
decrease significantly their use of various substances, including meth. So, um, and our case managers work really hard with our city to get folks into rapid rehousing programs and other things. So I think, you know, building on what you're saying, Richard, I think there, there's definitely more studying that needs to be done, but Housing First does, it makes sense um, that, that that would be really powerful. Yeah, and I just want to, you know, make the connection back to what everyone has been saying throughout the talk, and especially at the beginning when we we're talking about social determinants of health. You know, a lot of the times we're focusing on the drug use when really maybe somebody just needs a place to live. Um, so we should be looking into these other innovation, in, in, interventions and how healthcare should be brought into not just talk about what happens in a doctor's office. So one of our att attendees, Lana, poses a um, scenario that she's dealing with, um, particularly in um, low socioeconomic states like New Mexico, you know, access to residential care for substance use disorder treatment is very difficult to get. And most residential treatment centers are privately owned um, and do not work with Medicaid plans, which represents the majority of their population. It then requires those who practice outpatient um, care to create more robust wraparound services, um, so that they don't have to tell their patients, you know, you need a higher level of care and we can't treat you anymore, um, which would inevitably send them back to the unsupportive and harmful environments that are exacerbating substance use. So she's saying, you know, she feels like it's a resolving door and it further disrupts the continuum of care and wonders if the panelists have any thoughts, um, ideas, or suggestions to how to mitigate that issue. Kima, would you like to start us off on that? Yes, but let me rephrase because you're breaking up a little bit. The question is that the residential care is really hard to get into because it's private. Um, and, and even when they do, it's resolving, revolving door and not such great quality. Is that the general question? Yes, it's that there is, um, yes, essentially. Um, this resolving, revolving door between the residential care and the outpatient and the outpatient feeling like they don't have necessarily have the resources but don't want to send them back. Um, to care that would exacerbate the harms. Yeah, um, I for one, and this is a personal feeling, but do feel that we spend a little too much time on, on residential care, best of times. And so I do think, you know, it's like all of these systems we're talking about that kind of need to be gutted and rebuilt. Um, but I think there is a way in this movement um, to really think again about those quality measures and what is what is high quality care. And in that, you know, when um, substance use moved into the healthcare realm, although I don't quite think it's there, but as a healthcare provider, you get sued if you're given crappy care, right? And I think that um, <laughs> the same thing needs to happen if you're not held accountable, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do and it's a revolving door and you're not giving evidence-informed care, you probably shouldn't be getting paid and you, there should be some consequences. And the money then that's not used, because residential is wicked expensive, needs to go back to some of the outpatient providers and provide that panoply of other services, housing, food, the, you know, the other pieces I'm talking about. Because often, actually, that's what people need. They don't actually need the residential, where they're going in there for X amount of time and then getting out and not being linked or linked to places, as was talking, that have been starved for money. And so I think it is also, a lot of times people say that treatment, um, should have a health or public health response, but we have to be really careful about then what we're offering and calling treatment and making sure that it's really high quality and that the money is going where it can be most supportive. Um, and so I do think I like, I do think value-based care is, is a piece of that. Um, but I also think it's a space where you're going to have to do a lot of advocacy and someone mentioned it in the chat, which I've lost, but there are a lot of interest groups out here for docs, for residential treatment, for everyone who don't want the status quo to change, right? Um, and I own docs as much as, as much as anyone else. So there is going to have to be advocacy to make these changes that we want to see. And I, you know, and so working with people like DPA and DPA working with others to do that advocacy is going to be key. Let me follow up on that quickly because Leslie asked specifically, what are some ideas for how to prioritize advocacy at different levels of policy and resourcing. She gives the example that it seems to be accepted that there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution and localities need to meet their local needs. Um, but there might also be significant opportunities for resourcing and large-scale change um, at state and national levels. 
Uh, so when and how might it be effective to direct advocacy and policy ideas to state and federal decision makers versus every taking things minute of local? the day? <laughs> Sorry, like every single minute. Because the reality is that local work that you really want to do has to be paid for. And that, and, and, you know, working in healthcare and other um, spaces, there's money there. You know, if you look at the way that diabetes care has changed and it's, um, it's not perfect. Again, I bring you back to healthcare system issues, but it's much more patient centered. It's much more thoughtful. If you don't, if your insulin, if your hemoglobin A1C isn't perfect, they don't take away your insulin. They work with you. Don't eat the chocolate cake today. You know, even though you were stressed, I'm still going to give you a high level insulin so you don't die. There are basic ways that patients have said we demand for things to change, but that really only happen with local, state, and federal level advocacy. And so I am always pushing providers and others as much as you can to get involved in the advocacy space, to build those bridges, to redetermine where money comes from. You can work with foundations. They do not have the money to change the systems in the way we need them to change. The federal government is the largest payer. We pay taxes. We should determine, be able to say and determine how that money is spent more effectively. So yeah, like every single minute of the day, especially if you want to see equality and equitable care. Absolutely. Any other thoughts from panelists on that question since it's a big one? Yeah, it's a big one. Um, we at, at Casa de Salud have built in advocacy and community organizing into our work from before we even existed as a clinic. And we we feel very strongly that the only way to build power with community is to is is for folks doing things like providing healthcare to be doing something beyond the the work that they're doing in those you know within the four walls because in the end we don't want to just be giving things to people or providing care or having this power differential where someone's the patient and we're the doctor and we know everything but we are in community we care about all the issues we have unique perspectives um, and advocacy is so so critical and at this time seems like healthcare workers have become a bit more galvanized in a really good way. Um, because of COVID, we have this kind of larger um, emphasis around everything from the needs for PPE to so many other things where healthcare workers are, are uniting in a way that we haven't seen healthcare workers on different spectrums of the liberal conservative you know, areas come together um, as well before. And then with all the Black Lives Matters protests and healthcare workers really standing up, um, there's, there's been and, and there's an increasing amount of awareness and understanding of what we need to do. And we are, along with numerous other organizations, you know, taking this opportunity to advocate for changes at a county level, changes at a city level, um, changes at a state level in regards to everything from treatment, but beyond um, in regards to what we see our needs um, for patients in terms of financial costs of healthcare, to access to healthcare, um, to you know issues around structural determinants of, of health, things that we know beyond healthcare that affect our patients. And um, uh, that feels critically important and feels like there's an increasing consciousness around the nation about that. I might add in there really quickly too that I think that it um, prevents burnout. You know, I really do think that um, for me personally, uh, working with lawyers is like my favorite thing to do. Um, and, you know, policy workers and patients and working around the policy work um, in these diverse teams of all different sorts of interests is like really what keeps me sane sometimes. Because, you know, I think for all of us on the call, whether uh, and in the audience, whether you're doing street outreach, whether you're, you know, doing housing work, you know, really treatment, you know, whatever type of research, whatever you're doing, the day in day out of the things that make your blood boil, you know, can really take a toll mentally and physically and can make you burn out, you know, really can make you feel like you don't have what it takes to do the work for 30 years. But I think policy work does give you that feeling in conjunction with the other stuff you're doing because you get to take all that stuff that makes your blood boil and and do like you get to channel it into the policy work and build you know sometimes you're building collaborations with people you never would have thought you would have worked on <laughs> with something you're like how did this come to be right but it feels like good work when you get it done like when you change policies it it, it is I mean, I think hugely rewarding. Um, or if the work in and of itself, regardless of the outcome, the work in and of itself is rewarding. 
Great, thank you so much. Uh, we're approaching the end of our time, but I want to ask each of the panelists to uh, quickly give us one parting thought that you would like the attendees to take with them. Um, I'll just go in the order that we started with. So we'll start with Kima. Um, vote this November, please vote. <laughs> Great, <laughs> succinct. <laughs> All right, uh, Anjali. Uh, just so much gratitude for the Drug Policy Alliance for hosting this conversation and, and this series um, and for all of us to just keep on keeping on with with uh, thinking about really trying to lift up opportunities in this moment um, because there's so much heaviness and um, looking at opportunities um, I think will help us, like Lisa said, with burnout um, for ourselves and our communities. Thank you. Rupa, your parting thoughts? Just like uh, Anjali said, thank you for hosting this. And um, uh, the second thought that I have is now that telehealth and tele uh, telephone calls are in structure, they should be kept. They should not be taken away. They are a great, um, great asset for any physician who's working or any any clinician who's working with uh, people with substance use disorders, and that we should not let it go uh, because this has been brought and this should be uh, integrated into the whole picture. So thank you, thank you again. Great, thanks. Lisa? I echo what my uh, fellow panelists have said and also say I think um, may we all sort of go forward keeping people who are directly impacted by all of these systems really at the core of the work and leading the work um, um, along with us. Thank you. And Richard? I guess the academic in me has to, has to uh, 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 come up with my comment. A lot of the people, my other panelists, uh, and the people with uh, sending in questions are making really important observations about holes in the system, flaws in the system, ways the system can be uh, reconfigured um, to better meet the needs of our patients. Write down that stuff. Write, write it down. Take it to forums like ASAM and AAAP and other uh, conferences and groups to get them to get the keep those ideas alive and and so they don't just get used during this current crisis and disappear so that they get sustained. You got to write them down. You got to get them into the system so that um, they'll have a life beyond today. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of our speakers for joining us today and sharing their wisdom with us. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank everybody for joining in on the webinar. And to remind everyone, please join us for our next conversation on harm reduction and COVID-19 on June 25th. Thank you all. Take care.